my name is Stanley. Uh, I've been working uh, in advertising for quite some time. About, uh, I started my career you know, selling computers and then worked in advertising for about 10 years. And after that, uh, I quit advertising and uh, I started a company called Ivedia. It's more in terms of design uh, company. Uh, we do communication design. We do uh, uh, manage design for architects. We give inputs to product design. We work in the intersection of architecture, engineering, art, and communication. Now, uh, the most important aspect of this presentation is, uh, is staying awake. Uh, I know, I know, you all had a good meal, and you know, with, with this kind of gloomy environment, and uh, it may sound like a therapy, but I'm just going to talk about a few things. I want to. Uh, I, was, I was I was listening to some of your presentations. Uh, which is quite interesting. So, I wanted to be as interactive as possible. If there is anything that you guys want to ask, please put your hands up or probably, you know, we can shoot a question, we can discuss. Because I don't want this to be one way. And uh, uh, <clears throat> branding, as you know, uh, I'm not going to talk anything which is uh, rocket science or anything, but things that you actually know. That's a little bit of fundamentals. Then I'm going to talk to you about fat rate, uh, what we actually do for fat rate. And then I'm going to talk about something about social entrepreneurship, uh, which is uh, how we can actually uh, engage ourselves uh, in that particular area, which throws in a lot of opportunity. The last one is about design, uh, which brings my interest to it, of how design can be uh, uh, engaged to create value. So, there are some, we will look into certain definitions, probably you might have learned out of your textbook or through internet or through very many ways. Uh, a brand is simply an organization or a product or a service with a personality. Now, there are two things which I would like to tell you, like, you know, there is, uh, when you talk about a brand, you know, anything that is really visible has really caught us, our attentions, and we call it as a brand, Adidas, Nike, and so many other aspects. But what a brand in a, in a larger perspective encompasses, a brand is simply an organization. It could be an organization also, PSG can be a brand, UNESCO can be a brand, anything can be a brand. A product or a service with a personality. I'm going to run a little quicker on this. So why is so much fuss about fuss and confusion? This is because branding can encapsulate both big and important and apparently superficial and trivial issues simultaneously. You know when you when you uh, look into a brand like Sony or or a, or a Mac. You probably you know, take it very seriously and expect a lot of quality. But if you look at the, uh, the function or the activity of branding, it is very, very easy. You can, you can manufacture anything, put a sticker onto it, you know, with a nice logo or whatever, and then say, you know, I've branded a product, this, this might look like a brand. So two things. One, something which is of extreme quality, also you call it as a brand. And something that is very superficial, very trivial in nature, very, very elementary can also be, you know, called as a brand. Like, uh, you can go and buy a Nike t-shirt in a Sunday market as well. And, of course, you can buy, buy a lot of, uh, pay a lot of money in the store and buy it as well. So, the fuss is because, and the confusion is because, something that is really superlative can also be, you know, considered to be, uh, branding is considered that way. And it can also, you know, uh, be very trivial. Uh, we have consumer products, we have retail outlets. See, somebody had, had put their face as a logo, you know. Um, so, there are certain retail outlets. Like, you know, when you talk about, first you talk about consumer products, products can be branded. The second thing is about an outlet, destination brand, for example, green shop, somebody presented. That's a good good idea about, a, about an outlet. So here's an outlet where, you know, we decided to put this face. There could be luxury goods. You know, why, why should Ferrari do pens, you know? Because it's a powerful brand, not because uh, they would want to of course, they have a cars. An, an idea could be branded. So look at the India Shining uh, app. Whether it shone or not show, did not shine, uh, they, they still had the idea of uh, India Shining. Now, the one more very important attribute of branding is the style, style and substance. Often, style is confused with substance because it's the outward and visible signs of a brand that are symbols of differentiation. See how this particular symbol, the American flag, is differentiated in two different places. In the United States, it's a matter of pride. In the Middle East, it is torch. It is the same symbol. A lot of style. But I think it's a 
substance that really matters. What is being put into it? The meaning that is being put in, put into a visible or a visible brand or a sign. So here is branding. Like we all know what a brand is: a product brand, a service brand, etc. Now I'm going to move into a little further to tell you what branding and identity is all about. Branding is, a, is about identity. We all have names. We all have identity cards. There is a logo in it. We belong to a certain institution. So there is this word called identity. I would say, uh, how, let's let's look a little deeper and find out what branding versus identity you know can stand for. So what is an identity? Like every organization carries thousands of transactions every day. It buys, it sells, hires and fires. It makes, it pays, it cleans, it promotes. Informed <coughs> through communication, the web and other media, and so on. In all these transactions, these are, the organization will, in some way, be presenting itself or a part of itself to various groups of people with whom it deals. The totality of the way the organization presents itself can be called identity. What different audiences perceive is often called image. You go and buy a bad product in a nice branded store. The store also carries a, a bad image. The product also carries a brand image. And apart from all that, if you look at the branding, it has very many audiences. There are a lot of transactions that happen. For example, you go and ask a payment from a company or from an organization. They won't pay you. You go to a bank, you wait there for hours to deposit money or to get money those days. You want to get a loan, still you have to I mean, wait for a, quite a long time. So every single transaction works towards the identity of a specific brand. It could be a bank, it could be an organization, it could be a, a, an institution. For example, if the students of an institution are institutionists, they are smart, then it considered to be a smarter institution. The identity of the, of the institution is smarter. If they are lousy, then it is considered to be a lousy, a lousy institution. So, it, this is the fundamental thing which anybody needs to be very clear. Here, honesty matters. It's not about what you are trying to do. It's not about what you're trying to communicate to people. It's not what you're trying to advertise. It's what you're trying to live up for. For example, if you're a global organization, or if you say you're a global institution, first people inside the organization or inside the institution should believe that they are a global organization. There's no point in advertising saying that we are a global organization operating in 70 countries. First, their own people should believe. So I think identity is about that. It's about essentially who you are. So once when you transact, it could be giving of payment, it could be a packaging, it could be the way the quality is delivered, it, it, it could be the way your telephone operator answers the phone. It could be any kind of a transaction within a, within a brand or an organization. That will create the identity of that particular, of that particular brand or the organization. So this identity can project four, four ideas. One is who you are. It's not about what you claim to be. You can say that I'm the number one so manufacturer in India, you can claim whatever you want, but essentially who you are. What do you do? How do you do it? For example, a, 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 an organization or a, or a brand may produce fantastic products, great products. But if you go and look into the organization or look into the shop floor, if it has a very, very bad way of conducting business inside, if they don't treat the employees well, if they don't maintain the process well, I don't think the identity is really complete. And the last idea which, it, uh, uh, which, which an identity communicates is where you want to go. It, it clearly it talks about a vision of the, of, the, of, of, the, of the specific brand, of what its vision is all about for the next so many years, where it wants to go. So identity manages itself primarily through three main vectors, products and services, what you make or sell. This is very, very important. Second thing is environments, where you make or sell it. Third thing is communication, how we advertise or otherwise promote your product or services. The last one, the one which you can feel and almost some, sometimes almost see, behavior. For example, an airline company, it depends on the behavior. The way they treat you is very, very essential. Hospitality sector, very, very important. A hospit uh, 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 hospitality chain may have a very fantastic environment. The rooms may be great. The logo may be great, everything might be great, the food may be awesome, but if the service is bad, or if the behavior quality of the staff is bad, the, they're done. So, the last, these are the four main vectors of the brand.
So the fundamental idea behind any identity program, if anybody wants to build a company, many of you people would want to come out as entrepreneurs, as people who want to build a brand or an organization or anything. The very important thing behind an identity program is that everything the organization does, everything it owns, and everything it produces, it should project a clear idea what it, what it is and what it aims are. And everything should encompass in all the four vectors what I spoke earlier. Logo. <coughs> so, in that case then, you know, when you are clear about what the, uh, the values are, how you are going to manage quality, what are you going to put into your brand, etc., then probably a visual system, like a logo, will communicate what you actually stand for. Right? I think most of you are really asleep. So, I would like to ask if there are any doubts. Okay, now one single question. Now there are B2C brands, like Nike is a B2C brand. Name any B2B brand. No, no, no. Okay. Something else. Let's make it very simple. Okay, Blue Star. Now can you, uh, can you tell uh, how, how, uh, how do you, is there a, uh, sir, I think you know, just like if you can speak from the context of Keystone and uh, uh, yeah, branding from the I'm context. I'm just coming here because I want to establish this so that they can understand that. So, in a B2B, in a B2B area, for example, an engineering consulting company it could be even Infosys. Like Infosys wants to brand their particular, you know, the organization. One would say that they want to carry their identity. You should clearly understand that between Nike and Infosys. It is only the delivery that is the way the brand is delivered that is different. How do you deliver a brand? For example, Nike, you have fantastic communication programs, all that. You see a great advertising campaign going by by a pair of shoes. But when you talk about Infosys, you don't their customers don't buy it like that. But again, essentially branding is there. The identity is very, very part of the core of the selling process or all processes that they carry. So here the most important aspect on B2B is the way brand is being delivered. Here the brand is being delivered through every single transaction. Every single transaction of the organization that uh, the context said. Okay, now I'm going to talk to you about the uh, story of fat rate, what fat rate, uh, what we did for fat rate. A fat rate forum India uh, is a, as you know, that you know, uh, it's, a, it's an organization based out of uh, Delhi and uh, they have a lot of network members. They're mostly NGOs and self-help groups. They depend. They, uh, they mostly depended on exports because all the patented products were exported to the developed nations. And the idea of patented itself was uh, it was to promote uh, uh, economy to the underprivileged countries or the developing nations. So the background to branding was to do a pilot project. The role of branding was to endorse outlets. There were a lot of network members uh, who are producing diverse products and uh, they were into diverse products, handicrafts, food products, etc. So we decided to choose about 10 or 15 outlets, run a pilot branding and you know find out what, what's going to happen. So why did they want to brand? India was a potential market. The second reason was the failing global economy, because the, the global economy uh, was going through a recession. Uh, forced to look into a market like India and capture the opportunity. Uh, like in other countries, fat rate in India, fat rate in other countries had very significant product economies. Like fat rate Australia was more in terms of you know agriculture. There is 10,000 villages which also had a this is a fat rate brand again which had outlets across Europe. So we came up with the central idea of uh, hands that involve because it involved a uh, lot of uh, the network members. See, basically, you know, they were all network members of the network, and these were all indigenous communities and self-help groups that were creating products. So we decided to uh, have an idea called the hand, hands that involve. We decided uh, we we created a lot of brands. Uh, these are the ones which we gave them as options. So actually, from the agency, we really like this because uh, there's a there's a there's a uh, there's a liberated man or maybe an empowered person uh, drawn out of uh, hands. So but they like this. The fat rate forum like this, they wanted to use this. So we also like this. So and we extended them into uh, you know 
individual products, basic individual uh, communication uh, 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 material, like you know, one is your, your honey gets sweeter. So the coffee says, you know, if you buy a bottle of honey, the honey is more sweeter because not because the product is good, but just you're also trying to help the privileged, underprivileged communities. So these are some of the uh, touch points we work on. These are certain uh, in shop visual merchandise we work towards. This is essentially a brand wall which we decided so that a customer, when, when a customer walks in, uh, he would want to know uh, what fat rate India stands for, what are the mandates of fat rate. So, where did you actually place this? Which all shops, which all cities, or? We, placed about, we chose about 10 or uh, 15 outlets across India mm -hmm. and uh, we placed them. So, how did you uh, select those 15 cities? So it was provided to by the uh, fat rate forum because they selected about uh, 15, 15 people. 15 outlets to brand. I think there was a little bit, couple, two or three reasons. Uh, one was the typical reason, one is it's running as a pilot. Yeah. So one of the first criteria was the interest shown by the shop or the organization itself that you know that they would like to be part of this. Because for uh, for many shops, it could also be perceived as overtaking their idea. It's a perception that you know now you put a fat in India brand. I have been to my green shop brand for the last 10 years. What do I want to promote? Do I want to promote fat in India or do I want to promote green shop? So to those questions. So also it was a sort of a representative um, example being sent out for other shops. For others, because there are many more shops by these organizations. So this was one. And second thing also was to be able to put it geographically. You have it in different parts of the country, the Delhi, uh, Calcutta, Bombay, in the South, everywhere. So those are two or three criteria on which the first set of shops were selected. So, yeah. Which advertising agency made this? We made it. Which called, called, uh, we are not an advertising agency, we were a design company, so we did. Uh, it's called Miami India. So we did this. Uh, so we did some packaging. <coughs> And we did their stationery and stuff. We came up with a code book, you know, basically, you know, uh, one, we should understand that these are small shops, small shop owners, indigenous communities running their own uh, small, these are not large retail outlets. And they have very, very limited resources. For example, uh, if you look at the other outlets, I mean, they're all very captive environment where there was investment available and a lot of things available to run, but these people were all smaller outlets. And uh, we came up with a you know, certain certain code book that will help them out. So how can branding percolate into their areas, like signages, uh, a, a certificate and endorsement, a brand wall that will talk about the mandates of fat rate, uh, then you know some product labeling. Essentially, if you look at the products, these are the products. So some some in shop official merchandise. So because who, if you look at these kinds of who pays for this? Uh, uh, actually, uh, every every individual outlet. It's not a large sum of money. The idea of this pilot was to uh, because of because the fat rate forum consists of members, and uh, fat rate forum took the initiative to develop this, so that these files were delivered to their own locations, and they did their because it's a non-captive environment. We don't have a regular standard store format. Like Green Shop is a different format. Yes. Someone else who was in Calcutta is a different format. So it was them who actually, you know, did their own stuff with the with, with the uh, material that was given from us. So the signages and all which you're speaking about, all those dimensions were different. Everything, everything was standardized. Okay. So everything was standardized, and we did a basic study, and then that's how we came up. With so was there any, uh, uh, you know, just like 20% we will provide, 80% we will provide, was there any something the, like that? For the, for the, uh, for the retail, uh, uh, for the pilot project, Fair Trade Forum came up with a certain amount uh, to, I think they had an amount of about 30,000 or something, that they would chip in. And the balance of the investment was by the shops themselves. So whether it is signage, whether it is bags, uh, whether it is, all those brand walls, posters, everything. So we we have to we have to invest into that. So 
what happened then, <coughs> how those were endorsed. If you look at, none of the products can be endorsed here because the product is absolutely diverse. We are talking about hundreds of communities across the country, manufacturing handicrafts, manufacturing food products, natural products and lot many other products. So, and again there was, and Fabric Forum as an entity cannot endorse or does not have any quality, uh, you know, certification. That the quality of the product, they cannot certify the quality of the product. That is a major challenge. So what we did, we only branded the outlets. Products were not or cannot be endorsed. There were very little, very less communication. Outlets, if you look at a fat rate for an outlet, the outlet not only sold fat rate products, they also sold products out of the fat rate network members. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, but isn't that a risk? Uh? No, that's how it was because uh, revenue was a problem. No, when you're, you're, okay. when you're speaking that you're not actually uh, endorsing a product, you're only endorsing that, you know, to sell. Yeah, and you're telling, you know, we are, they are selling other products also then. Uh, See, uh, I'll give you an example of the brain shop. Yeah. So, what we did was, we started with the brain shop. Last forest itself, the uh, network member covers a large portion. Yeah. The balance we cover from the, the second thing that we said was that over a period of time, they should have at least four or five other network member products. Mm -hmm. It's not only pro me promoting myself. You know, that was not the aim of this exercise. The aim of this exercise was to create an umbrella thing where you leverage on this brand and cross support each other. You know, so that I, I today, when I'm standing in Kutir, I should be able to say that there is a fair trade shop in Calcutta to a customer. There is a fair trade shop in Bhutan. Yeah. So that that was the that was the exercise. But at the same time, the balance 40 percent is not for me to sell coke and base chips, but to be able to sell products from a self-help group yeah. in Kulu. Yes. Yeah. Now they are not part of the fair trade facility, yeah. but they form part of the principles of on which fair trade is, is based so that they might, they might not be a direct member paying a certain amount of fees and going for you know a screening and all that sort of thing but to be able to also allow space to build that local market see I might have things around both regions will not sell around Calcutta Calcutta people will have things which they want to sell from around them they might not be fair trade network members so it's a risk Yes, but it's also an opportunity that no, none of these federal shops are the same. That the diversity is their strength. Is the fun in the whole thing. Okay, so that space was intentionally created or it is like uh, because you did not have... Uh... No, basically this was not, as I told you, it's a non-capital environment. It is a non-capital environment because everybody sustained. All these, wild, uh, all these people made their money by exporting their products. There was no forum that... Uh, Forum did not promote create a local market or address a local opportunity. Now, because you know there is resistance outside, then they think that India is a great land of opportunity now to sell these products. We need uh, we we, we, we uh, violated this branding exercise. That's the primary reason. So if you look at, uh, I don't know how many of you have been following this or whatever. This is very typical to the green shop presentation <coughs> someone made uh, in the afternoon. And uh, maybe the forthcoming slides I'll, keep, uh, I'll tell you about it. But the idea is, we would like to have your recommendation. Probably if you can take a, a visit to the Green Shop or probably go to the website of Fabric, find out and let us know in what way do you think that uh, a promotion or build a very strong economy within the Fabric Forum network members. That would be really ideal, and you can mail Matthew and. Uh, this is the close about one year, about six, seven, eight months. Now we have we have done this exercise across India, and uh, about three or four outlets of Green Shop have been branded, and uh, I think there is some significant amount of uh, I wouldn't say sale, but rather some amount of visibility towards battery that's being built. The future is uncertain. As I told you, the products we cannot assure that the products you go and buy there are ex expected certain quality, but it's based on. Like a peer reviewing system, everybody built you know, vouchers for, for their product. So probably you know, I would leave that as an exercise to you because uh, it would be uh, really encouraging if you can send us your ideas as well. Uh, 
products are diverse handicraft food products and textile products. Let us, uh, when, when you, you can discuss with us gaps and I think what, um, what it has done tremendously with this branding exercise is created a strong visibility for consumers. And that's the message that has come back. And so consumers suddenly, you know, this, this fair trade, what it has, curiosity has come in, you know. Because fair trade is not a, like organic, fair trade is not recognized only within our own country so much. It has created that excitement element. Also it has, with this sort of an umbrella thing, uh, the, the identification of all these shops, you know, that I'm part of that network, you know, I, I'm part of that umbrella, that has come out very strongly. And all, all, all the people who participated in it, they feel that positive energy being generated. Yeah, I, I received a few ways. I don't know whether that they are related to this. Uh, there is one fair trade, uh, you know, forum for textiles, and uh, the CEO's name is one Safe Pictures. Safe Pictures. Yeah. yeah. So shop for change. Yeah. So shop for change. Yeah. So that that's also they are also speaking about fair trade and. Uh, yeah, they are also. I mean, this fair trade forum in India is a is a is part of an international body which is World Fair Trade. Uh, Organization, WFT. Yeah, yeah. The last time we met. Then there is WFT Asia. Okay. And this is the country network. Mm. Yeah. Now, Shop for Chain is also collaborating with Fair Trade Forum India, but on some other, on some other. But, but one thing significantly, what Shop for Chain has done is they've gotten into the product level. The value chain yeah. is even more deeper. Yeah. yeah. So they certify. They they get into the place and they ensure that there are certain quality parameters that are met before it gets into the retail outlet. Mm -hmm. So that way, I think it will complement fat trade over a period of time for a fat trade forum also will adapt that particular process, those, those procedures. Yeah, the reason I mentioned here it is you know, it was like uh, uh, as an individual I was looking for fair trade products in India and it was not available and then once I got a mail from this shop for change telling that okay this is launched in India so I thought oh it's a great thing you know it was like India also yes, has a fair trade. It's primarily uh, textile products. Yes. Yes. And they are now yes. trying to get into other products. Okay. But here what happens is you already have so many network members producing handicrafts in a lot of, lot of products. So to create a code for all yes. the products, the quality yeah. parameters, it will take some time. Uh, the fourth, fourth aspect is I just wanted to uh, quickly run through uh, social enterprise. For example, green shop. Somebody had another green shop in Kodumudi, and you know, I don't know whoever it is. Uh, yeah. So, okay, basically, we are looking at some social enterprise in rural planning. Assume that you know, these social enterprises are most of them are NGOs, they work with indigenous communities. This is a place of opportunity, I think, you people manage can also intersect in terms of. Uh, creating uh, value. Uh, here, you know, I would like to uh, look in terms of contribution from your end as well, because we are also working towards a lot of, uh, uh, you know, we are working with Keystone Foundation in uh, in creating value wherever possible. So, if you look at a typical Keystone Foundation or a green shop, last forest kind of a setup, uh, you know, these communities are being taught, and few products are made. You look at soaps. Look at honey that's being packaged, etc. Probably they know some traditional skill. This is the scenario of a community. Uh, if you want to make their lives sustainable, it's a, it's a larger issue than livelihood. The whole ecosystem is involved. For example, if Matthew has to uh, increase the honey production, he cannot do anything unless they have a larger idea to ensure that the ecosystem, the nature ecosystem, is addressed. This will include the natural habitat, it will include climate, uh, cl climate issues and other sustainable issues so that the environment is really kept sane so that at least you know, whatever honey is being produced is being brought into the table so that these communities can sustain. So if you look at it, it's not just a commercial activity but rather it involves a larger ecosystem uh, into, into place. And like climate issues, there are also issues, social cultural issues that are there. So I don't know if you have visited uh, uh, the Neil Gillis and you know there are some really interesting stuff that, that, that's happening there. And these communities, they might be confident or they might not be confident. Again, these communities will be able to produce low volumes like your green, uh, green shop or the organic, typical organic products, you cannot scale. So these are very, very limited in number. If there is a producer group, they can only manufacture so much. So, they have limited strength and it is not built to scale. 
Like if anybody wants to get into the social sector and do some entrepreneurial work, it is definitely not scalable. So if you look at like all the presentations, commercially not viable. Are you making money? Is an organic farmer making money? No. He will never make money in his whole life if he remains as a small farmer. You are being very pessimistic. Oh, and I'm not pessimistic. pessimistic. That's the reality. I'll tell you why. Whole world, small farmers will never make money. Right? So, so let us discuss certain models. Economies of scale to relational economy. Now, in the industrial economy, like if you want to become a businessman and you know make some products, like assuming that you want to make shoes, you will always vision to make a million pieces of shoes. Your factory is designed in such a way, your business plan is designed in such a way that you know there is a scale that is built into your business model. But whether it is organic uh, farming or any of these social entrepreneurial models, build to scale model will never work. Economies of scale a model will never work. Industrial industrialization model, the, if you look at the industrial era, the model was built to scale, starting from 4T model. The biggest invention of Ford was not the motor car, but the assembly line. He built the assembly line so that hundreds and thousands of cars can be uh, built. So if you look at these kinds of models, these are relational economy, right? economic models. We need to also, if anybody of you are interested, we need to look at farm to fork models. Now there was somebody who was trying to uh, look at the, the, especially the organic uh, vegetables. Vegetables are whatever farm produce. Now farm to fork models. Uh, somebody was talking about the share. I don't know who, who were, like, you know, who distributed shares. Okay. Now, um, <laughs> see, the most important aspect here is, the most important aspect here is, we are, we are a consumer-driven economy. And we people uh, have, have really forgotten about what a farmer does. Here, the shares can be vegetable shares, if you really look at it. Instead of money, this can be vegetable shares. And farm to fork models, if you are trying to connect the farming community and the consumption, where the consumption happens, if you build a community here, which will ensure that they will consume whatever the farmer produces, these could be local economies that are going, that can be created. See, tomorrow if you look at the Hindustan Lever or, any, or Unilever or any of these organizations, these organizations have started, already started working, to, working, to, working towards creating platforms. Tomorrow, your management jobs could be not at corporate headquarters, but at grassroots level, creating platforms. Because the establishment cost of these great organizations, or large organizations, have become very, very heavy. Now they want to create alternate models. Alternate models mean creating platforms where the producer groups and the consumption groups are very, very close. This has started to happen, and I think this is the way that's going to be in the future. And true sustainability happens only through these kind of farm to fork models. Because why do you want to produce something here and you know transport it about 300, 4,000 miles away and then sell it there? It doesn't make any sense in terms of sustainability. So this is the second one which I wanted to tell you. Assume that I'm a tribal company of 3,000 people in number. I can make some traditional products. It could be food, it could be textiles, it could be anything. Uh, I can make a sizable volume. I will not do a real large volume. Can you create a, an economy? Uh, can you create a model for me? Can you speculate on a business model? I am talking about real time efforts. We are working with some of very, very interesting groups across the country. If anybody is interested to participate with us on this, you can participate. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you can might as well use the intellectual property. We can work with a very uh, uh, encouraging organization. Uh, so, I leave it to you. So, the last thing is about the value creation. Like, if at all you want to have to float a brand or to build a business or anything, you require value. And design is about value creation. How many of you have heard about design thinking? Like, management thinking? Have you heard about design thinking? Yeah, Nike has that. Uh, now, you should, you should definitely go and Google design thinking because management thinking is dying. And design thinking is going to be the future. So, what is design? It's more about problem solving. In your management plan, you'll be looking at take the problem, problem becomes the opportunity, and then you work backwards. 
Design thinking doesn't work that way. It's a matter of putting the things together to create and deliver value. See, this is typically a social entrepreneurial product. Putting things together and you know, delivering the product like this. This is somewhere south of Madurai. This is, this is nothing but this is nothing but create getting bio your, your your bio waste or your forest uh, your wood and the, all that converting charcoal into powder powder briquettes and creating an economy. Look at something like this. How many of you have heard about this coke uh, model? See, coke has reached almost every nook and corner. For example, there's a place called Hindu Marada. How many people know about it? You know about it, right? There is no hospital there. There is a task bank. <laughs> if there is a task bank, then coke is there. Right? Now, this is about a, a product called Cola Life. They use the gaps, they use the space that is available on Cola crates to deliver medicines to people. Okay? So this is basically something that is already available. He has created value and it has converted into a fantastic business. This is a typical example of design thinking. Look at this product. It's nothing but a normal drum which we use to use. This is called Hippo Water Roller. A small product innovation that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic uh, product because because here people have got a problem and have to find a problem for the product opportunity. I'm trying to tell you an example of design thinking. Management thinking would talk about problem solving. Design thinking works from bottom up. You put things together and create value. Uh, creating new value using existing framework. For example, in your premises, PLG, I think almost 60% of the space would be underutilized. Right? Any institution, more than 60 to 70 percent of the space is underutilized. You are paying, you are paying your school your fees based on the space that is available, the maintenance, and so on and so forth. So, with given resources, there are so much of resources that are available in the world. The idea of even sustainability is about that. And using those resources, you can create economies. You can create product economies. You can create service economies. You can create experience economies. So this is one uh, group which I interacted last week in Delhi. These guys are out of a place called Peckham in uh, southeast of London. And uh, these guys were, you know, their, their place used to be a dumping yard. They dump industrial waste and pellets and things like that. So these guys have created products out of absolute scrap. This, this table they designed in Delhi. In three days, they were there. So these are those guys, they went into a, if you look at this tool specifically, the, the, the legs of the tool is nothing but the, the policeman uses the uh, club, it's nothing but the club, they use some cycle chains to put things together. <coughs> this table they rented out of a scrap yard in just three days. I'm telling you, why I'm giving you this example is because there are so many communities and so many uh, skills that are available in our country and I'm, I'm sure that you know we'll be able to create these kinds of economies to get more creative. So now you management deals with a lot of analysis if I'm not wrong. That you use data, plenty of data to do analysis. What out of analysis you find what the truth is. That's how you write the inference. What is truth to, truth to analysis, values to design. Now today, the, the, the next, the forthcoming years is going to be about how you create value, significant value. It's a matter of putting together the current knowledge and resource to deliver new value. Uh, I happen to also, you should check this website, this is called as 40 Project. This is about sanitation. 40project.in is about, this is a knowledge base uh, which they have created uh, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So this, this talks about the behavioral pattern of how people in India shift. So there are, this is a basically a qualitative analysis on, on open city. So 
with this data, an architect or a collector or, a, or anybody who wants to be in that space to do something, can build toilets, can design products using these inferences. And uh, there is tremendous amount of scope. There's whole lot of close to about 53 people in India are sitting over. And I'm sure there will be con there will be continuous amount of money that's flowing in, and you know we can't change it overnight. It's going to be a pretty long time. These are spaces where people can actually you know pitch in and create some value. Let me summarize about design thinking and sign off. Uh, traditional thinking is more about judgment, what is right and what is not right. Output of design thinking is value. We need to create significant value. Design thinking about is about more of more of what can be than what is. For example, what a toilet can be. Can it look like a post office? Might be weird, but I'm just telling you. What it can be. What a class classroom can be. If we design it, we, we met an architect from the UK. And he's an architect who is designing a lot of institutions. Now he's redefined what schools are all about. The idea is the school is less of building and more of everything else. So why we need to have so big of a building? It's a great idea. So the government has appointed him. To, do, to work on a real financial structure, to define what school is beyond classroom. Probably you guys might need just only one room, that's it. Or maybe a whole, whole institution might need only four rooms. Because most of the work, there's, as far as management is concerned, there is no one answer to the problem, which means it's about abstract. For abstraction, you don't need any finite area to sit down four walls in this case. Probably you might be outside. This is exactly what the idea of a college or an institution can be. Right? This comes out of design thinking. So traditional thinking needs to work with facts. <coughs> design thinking needs to work with perfection, a perception. When you say perception, for example, if I ask everybody, one of one of you, to joke about my lecture, right? Then I will know what exactly a lecture should not be and what a lecture should be. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you sit down and joke about a, a toilet, right, and write on all the jokes, we will, we will come to know about what a toilet should be and what a toilet should not be. So design is about perception. So I think design, I, I encourage you to go and you know, Google design thinking and see what products have come through. For example, if you look at the Mac, they have a lot of design thinking inside. So. Uh, Thank you for this opportunity. And when you are if you are interested to work with any of these organizations, I showed you now the body project or or any other uh, plus in terms of work with these organizations. So if anybody is really serious to work, to work with us, to let us know and uh, we will be able to take it.
And I think that's why in, the, in this impersonal world that we have created and we love to, we love to sit because, you know, we're not responsible to anybody. Yeah. I can sit on Facebook and chatter off 101 things. I'm not responsible for that. Yeah. Somebody else. But in this relationship that we want, I want you to build is to build physical living relationships. Whether it's with communities, whether it's with an economy, whether it's with a shop, whether it's with a hospital nearby, whether it's with a tourism industry local. I mean, so you don't think, you know, when I say local, local economy, it's only, you know, somebody making some pottery and, and, and making some honey. No. It's in whatever you may be doing. Can you build that? Is it with an education system around you? Can you can can you think? Can you innovate? Yeah. There's two things that I can think of. Okay. Yeah. So on those notes, we will end this session and I'm thankful to Mr. Matthew. Thank you for coming in, sir.